É. Boa tarde, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm, the, I'm not Nuno Crespo, who was supposed to be here, but I'm in his place, I'm Luis Camilo, and it's a pleasure to be presenting our guest for this afternoon, it's Professor Delphine Sardo. He's the administrator of the Centro Cultural de Belém in Lisbon. Most of you know about it. And he teaches at the Faculdade de Belas Artes in, in, in Lisbon, where he also coordinates uh, an MA in curatorial studies. He has published a lot on contemporary art and, well, modern and contemporary architecture and and so forth, being curator of many, many shows all over. So it's someone that suits very well in this uh, seminar around uh, montage. So thank you, Delphine, for accepting the invitation. And, and also, as I said yesterday, uh, I'm doing my postdoc both with Delphine Lisbon and Nuno Crespo in in Porto, so it's a it's a pleasure to to be here with him. Well, uh, well thank you very much, Luis Camilo. It's uh, obviously a pleasure coming here, and uh, I'm very glad to to be able to participate in this uh, in this seminar. Um, I will try to contribute in uh, some points to the discussion on montage and collage um, and um, well I'm gonna I'll be open then to questions and uh, a bit of a dialogue no. oh yes okay um, so let's uh, let's begin <coughs> so art experience is usually understood as an experience that involves the global of perceptive experiences. More than that, the experience of art is usually conceived as an experience that enhances a global involvement of the viewer, engaging the beholder in a transformative path from the small recognition of details to the global projective drive of more immersive experiences. All of this is obviously common sense. And it has been treated in philosophical analysis, namely from John Dewey to Richard Schusterman, with a large spectrum of very, very different approaches. The, the focus of my talk is different. The goal is to address edition and montage, a compound of technical and dystechnical apparatus that are based exactly on the opposite, the composition of fragments, to construct a larger picture or image, static or moving, that reconfigures analytically or synthetically the possibility of the scattered experience of the world or its representation, uh, meaning that in the end, I will also try to address a kind of curatorial epistemology. In visual arts, the origin of montage is usually linked to the invention of the collage. And the collage is systematically attributed to Picasso and Georges Braque, which are, we are seeing uh, Nature Morte à la Chaise Canet, a Picasso painting from 1912. The main topic of the invention of collage is the ontological reconfiguration of the unity of the picture, Although it is clear that the building of the suspension of disbelief based on the unity of the pictorial image has been largely discussed through art history, um, it has largely been already scattered by Cezanne, or in perhaps a more subtle way by Matisse. All this has been largely discussed through art history, arriving to the invention of collage by Picasso and Braque. The creation of the collage 
brings to the universe of painting the possibility of avant la lettre, coming to terms with the concept of verfremdung, or distancing, used by Bertolt Brecht. The unity of the picture plane is not conceived through the coherence of elements, but is driven by the possibility of an indexality built on the distance between the elements of the image and its depiction as representations inside the representational character of the picture plane. As it happens on Brecht's dramaturgical approach, the possibility of an actor getting out of his character and addressing directly the audience, sometimes referring to the character he was interpreting, implies a scattering of the representational structure of the performance in order to build a distance that is, that is the possible space for criticism or for building criticism. As Thierry de Duve once wrote, it destroys the possibility, the collage, destroys the possibility of the trompe l'œil by a détrompe l'œil, which is a visual pun, pointing the painting from a third person point of view as an indexality as how painting works, uh, something that was very well understood much later on by John Baldessari. The next important move comes from the use of collage in the context of the use of photographic and printed images, most of the time collected from printed material, as it is the case of Kurt Schwitters or uh, Gustav Klusis. The interesting thing when we see the collages of Klusis or Schwitters is the extreme quality of the craftsmanship. The care in the composition and the focus on the precision of the aesthetical qualities of the newborn composite image. That for me was very striking. The first time that I saw for real a collage by Kurt Schwitters, uh, I was uh, immensely impressed by the absolute precision of the craftsmanship that was implied in the collage. In some way, uh, going against uh, the most of the discourses on the informality of the procedures of, of collage. The case is particularly interesting in Schwitters, given, given the connection that never really happened with the Dada movement. The fact is that Schwitters, and we will return to him, was always a craftsman. And that is visible in the original collage structure of his major never finished piece, which is a modernist curse, Merzbau. Sorry, Merzbau. That was born from a three-dimensional collage of a puppet head on a column. The accumulation developed in space to a progressively more complex special structure, first in Hanover and then in Norway. The image that you are seeing is uh, an, an intermediary stage between the first column and then the transformation of the old structure into the complete space of the Merzbau. The, the Ernst Schwitters, the, the, the son of Kurt Schwitters, had a very curious uh, expression to to, to tell the story of the Merzbau. He used to say that his father began by working in the studio and then he was working the studio. And as a matter of fact, all the space of the studio was transformed into a, a complete and global situation for uh, the potential viewer, which he makes very clear in a very interesting letter that he wrote in 1936 um, to, to Alfred Barr when he was offering the possibility of the MoMA to buy the Merzbau. Um, and he was saying that it was not really an architecture because architects would do it much better than he could do. It was a cubist sculpture where one could go and return. That's his, uh, his expression. And uh, it, for me, it's very interesting, this term, a cubist sculpture, because if the, the problem of cubism 
uh, was the transformation of the representation of three dimensions into a two-dimensional image. So what is a cubist sculpture, which is already three-dimensional? And uh, uh, it seems to me that he's referring to the fourth dimension, so he was referring to time, that uh, it was the possibility of doing with the sculpture what one does with the socks after washing them and putting them in the drawer, which is putting the hand inside and turning them inside out. And he was turning sculpture inside out into something that you can go inside, that you can visit. Um, and visiting implies a certain time, a certain movement in space, a certain uh, depiction of, of the time of viewing or the time of being inside as the main problem that he was addressing at the time. In the first place, so it seems that the required question is how can we address the potential contradiction between the craftsmanship of the collage process and the conceptual approach that art history deposit, deposited in collage, much more as a conceptual uh, tool than uh, a craftsmanship, a, a very fine craftsmanship uh, work. So let's go back to the birth of the collage. It is common ground in, art, in art history books to link the collage to the scattering of the picture plane. As a matter of fact, the collage as a visual strategy presupposes the need to find a different collapsing of different times inside the same picture plane and frequently different spaces also. The juxtaposition of different image sources by the diverse nature of the images promotes the entangling at different times and spaces inside the same image, introducing heterochronicity and a heterotopic quality inside the image. Of course, those characteristics can be traced back, if we want, to Carpaccio, on the combination of the image of the Madonna and the child with the life of Saint Geronimus, or the use of the predella in ancient painting, but the historical link uh, can perhaps align us to lines of thought. The first one links the strategy of time and place juxtaposition of the collage to theater, following the line that Michel Serre established precisely when commenting this, uh, this painting from Carpaccio in a, uh, in, a, in a book that is a very much forgotten book called Esthétique sur Carpaccio. Uh, in the sense that it builds a specific stage for the performativity of time and space. In this sense, collage is a depiction of a staged time capsule inside which several times and spaces build a narrative or allow the possibility of a situation, not necessarily a narrative. The second one focuses on the self-conscious construction of the performativity of time a factura of time inside a bi-dimensional image. Benjamin Buchlow wrote extensively on, on this topic, and we can detain just a bit on one of his texts, a very influential text published in 1984 called From Factura to Factography. The concept of factura proposed by David Burliuk, Mikhail Larionov, and Vladimir Markov is basically the notion that the final haptic quality resulting from the confluence of all elements of an artwork is what produces the result that is available to the beholder. It is a kind of version of the idea of final cause in Aristotelian terms, meaning that it is the sum of formal, material and mechanical causes. Tarabukin, in 1916, defined factura as the confluence from material and construction, and construction here means the specific requirements of the specialization of the work of the materiality that is being depicted. It, uh, um, Catherine Cook is very um, 
precise uh, pointing that the, the term, and I, I don't speak Russian, but the, the term uh, constructive, constructivist in, in Russian is much more linked to the idea of an absolute specialized uh, kind of work, like, a, like today we would call uh, perhaps an informatic engineer or someone that has a very precise technical approach to a, a specific field, than the idea of construction uh, in, in the sense of putting one thing on top of, of another. Um, that is what allows an artwork to become a whole. Letting aside the connections between factura and the, produc the productionist perspective, the introduction of photomontage in Russian avant-garde, namely by Gustav Klusis, Rodchenko and Lisitsky, introduces a new aspect to the notion of factura, but also a new direction to the use of previous photographic source materials. While photocollage was, uh, or in, in its origin was, um, a unique image, a photomontage is a reproducible image necessarily linked to the production of an effect. The curious thing is that the advent of photomontage is claimed by the Berlin Dadaists and its use by the Leff artists is accompanied by a criticism of the advertisement-influenced use of photomontage by the Dadaists. Nevertheless, their justification of the interest of photomontage is linked to its effectiveness in communicational terms. It is an agitational tool that is directed to the masses and that would have an important effect on the exhibition construction from 1927 on, namely with Lisitsky and Rodchenko from the Pressa exhibition on. So on a very first approach, what we can recognize here is the development of two main lines of, uh, of development that intertwine. The use of collage as a way of scattering the picture plane, and the second moment of using the dark chamber as a tool to rebuild the semantic unity of the scattered picture plane. In the middle of this stands the complexity of Eisenstein's approach to editing. So these are this is a, a, a Clusi's uh, photomontage and the Pressa exhibition. In 1929, Sergei Eisenstein wrote a text for a conference that he was supposed to deliver at the Stuttgart Photo Kino exhibition. He never delivered it because he was too busy re-editing the general line uh, film strongly criticized by Stalin. Uh, well, he had to re-edit the, 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 the film, titled Stuttgart Dramaturgy of Form, it was the title of the conference, where he defends an idea of film anchored in the conflict between photograms articulated through editing and through montage. In this text, the dramaturgical construction of film doesn't rely on the sequence of static images, but on the management of conflicts through the juxtaposition of images. In this sense, editing is not the construction of a rhythm that derives from the editing process. It is not a result of the situation of an image next to another one, which wouldn't distinguish from the fusion that is the result from the succession of photograms, but from the setting of an element, as he says, on top of another, which is in the, in the folio six of the Stuttgart conference. We could link this statement to the passage in Ulysses, where Stephen Dedalus understands, while he is walking on the beach, through the sound of, of his feet in, in the gravel, the difference between the visual experience, what he calls Nebeneinander, which means one thing next to another, um, and the sound experience, which he calls Nacheinander, one thing after the other. The proposal from Eisenstein is three-dimensional, 
one thing on top of the other. But starting from the grounding idea that this construction is based on the conflict between one static image and another conflictual and contradictory image that from a cut follows on top of the previous one. What Eisenstein describes as a tone uh, or, or Stimmung is in this context the result of the conflictual counterpoint in the musical sense, which is the base of the construction of space and time in film. And this is the center of what he calls the concept of the filmic space-time construction, or, so to say, the possibility of being, building a unity that he links to the Japanese writing by a specialization of the juxtaposition of fragments. The examples that Eisenstein provides for the references to such a constructive strategy are very diverse, from cubism to futurism. But the common ground is the possibility of a concept stemming from an inner conflict between fragments. Here the idea of conflict is the central idea. Eisenstein's text follows this line of thought in a phenomenological approach, either in terms of point of view, scale, the fragment versus the overall image, or color, even if color was at the time outside of the realm of cinema. His focus on the counterpoint and subsequently on the Stimmung deserves to be quoted. He says, counterpoint, conflict of both, what was preserved and what will appear, produces the dynamics of the game of colors. We are just a step between the visual vibration and the acoustic vibration, and we are in the field of music, in the field of spatial images to the field of spatial images." End of quote. He bases his filmic grammar, that's how he mentions it, on this epistemology of the continuum of space and time allowed by the consideration that each image is the cellular material for edition, finally defending an ending of a dualist approach between image and montage because they are two sides from the same story. To quote a very famous Michael Snow uh, work that has the same name, two sides to every story. The conclusion is that the concept, and I quote, explodes in increasing intensity in the montage conflict of the intervals between images. The interesting thing is that this never lectured lecture was written in the same year that Abi Warburg died, letting his Atlas Mnemosine definitely unfinished like the Grand Vert. Let's make a shift to Abi Warburg, the German uh, historian, and uh, his Mnemosine project, which was done between 1924 and 1929, which was the year he died, and the idea of an art history produced by the juxtaposition of images collected from different sources, from images of artworks to cutouts from magazines. The center of this project has been commented by numerous studies and analyses, but all of them focus on two main characteristics. Uh, the possibility of producing connections between movements, more than between images, and the importance of the interval between them. The first of these topics has been developed by a pioneer way, in a pioneer way, by Philippe Alain Michaud, in 1999, in one of the really uh, first approaches that connect uh, Abi Warburg's Bilder Atlas, or Mnemosine, to uh, cinema, connecting the project of Bilder Atlas to the, to the methodology of montage in cinema. Right in the beginning of the first version of this text, a conference at the Ecole Normale Supérieure that led to a book later on, Michaud links the construction of the Builder Atlas to the formula iconology of the interval that Warburg established in 1929, so just shortly before his death. 
The idea of an iconology of the interval is obviously connected with the iconography of his pupil Irvin Panofsky, but it doesn't rely on the possibilities of signifying images, but on the open field of relations that can be established through the connections that are made or produced between them outside the order of speech. And that, that idea that Philippe Alamichaud stresses is quite important, that uh, those connections, they are necessarily outside the order of speech. The difference is enormous, not only because of the obvious suspicion on the possibilities of a unifying speech that builds a narrative inside each image, which he is very suspicious of, but also and foremost because of the metamorphical character of the permanent possibilities that can stem out of diverse recombinations of the images that constitute each plate and the sequence between them in the organizations of the Builder Atlas. The difference between the idea of an iconology opposed to, na, to an iconography is precisely the iconographic possibility of establishing a discourse that takes the image as a, re as a readable entity opposite to the idea of an image that can contribute to the production of clust clusters of inferences of a logos as an explanation of a, multi a multitude of possible inferences. Here you have, uh, well, a very famous photo of uh, a sequence of the plates from the, the Bilder Atlas, the photograph that was taken of the, of the, uh, at the Kunstwissenschaft uh, Library uh, of Abbey Warburg in uh, Hamburg. <clears throat> Everyone that had the possibility of visiting the, the Warburg Institute, Warburg and Cortot Institute in London, as I happily had the chance, faced the puzzlement of the enormous number of boxes with different photographic combinations of images, different images of plates with several tests on the possibilities of the semantic clouds produced by the tests on the intervals between images. The, let me just uh, uh, tell you this, this story, it's like an anecdote. Uh, I, Many years ago, in, in precisely in 1999, um, I went to London, I was making an exhibition around Abbey Warburg. And uh, I had the possibility of, uh, of being invited by uh, Nicholas Mann, who was at the time the director of the Warburg Institute, to go there and look at the Warburg archive for myself. And um, I was received by a librarian, an archivist, um, a German lady who was like the, the, let's say, the ghost of Gertrude Bing, which was the secretary of, of Api Warburg, uh, still, uh, still there, present. And uh, in, a very, in a very dry way, uh, she said, so you, you, want to, you want to see the Builder Atlas? And said, yes, if possible. And she opened the door to a room that had on tables boxes and boxes and boxes of photo photographs of the plates and the individual images with no order whatsoever. So it said, so build a atlas, take a look. <laughs> and I, I, I feel like drowning completely in, the, in, the, in, in that situation. So I was opening boxes and taking the photographs out and opening boxes and taking the photo. And, and my aim was to make an exhibition with a version of the Builder Atlas. And of course, it was after one day, I was totally convinced that I would never do the exhibition because I could not find an order that would be uh, defensible. Uh, like hundreds or thousands of orders between those plates could be, could be used. And at a certain moment, uh, opening one box, I, I saw um, a group of images that were bound together and that had written uh, by the hand of, um, of Gertrude Bing, the handwriting of Gertrude Bing had, had uh, a note saying, uh, Builder Atlas, working copy, 1928. And I grabbed to that like a... Uh, 
uh, like the possibility of just not getting totally killed by the situation. And, uh, and the, the Nicholas Mann was very, very, uh, he was incredibly gentle and allowed us to, to separate the, the, the different plates and to make the exhibition with those plates that had an order that was an order that one could link to a certain moment of the research of, of, of Abi Warburg. And, uh, so it was shown in Coimbra, anyway, in 2000. Um, so, but the, the, the question is not uh, those, the, the, that puzzlement about the methodology of the, those clusters of images and the different combinations between them and the different meanings that can stem out of that, but it's also the system of the catalog of the library, the library, well, this one, and also in London, how it was. Uh, the catalog of the uh, of library is completely designed to a physical exploration of the shelves, grouped by theme, but no order between the books. Uh, at the time, people were advised uh, not to try to see the catalog, but to go inside the library and check the shelves. And the idea is, in the middle of what you are looking for, you'll find something that is perhaps more interesting than what you knew that you wanted. Um, and it had a name for, Bar for Warburg. The name was the rule of the good neighborhood, as he called it. And it allowed the visitor to produce himself a montage of references led by stimuli, driven by titles, or by covers, or by tables of contents. Michaud states that each of the plays, regardless of the combinations they depict, produce a constellation, following Werner Hoffmann, meaning that they produce a certain setting of meaning possibilities with open connections available. This possibility of neighboring images or books in the library is at the same time completely programmatic and movable, not only physically, because the images occupy in different versions, alternate locations, but semantically in the sense that they are open to different ways, levels, and procedures of connection. Or, in other words, it is, it is not their isomorphic possibilities that are at the core of the process, but precisely the opposite. It's the conflict between them that builds the importance of the interval as a field of potential in potential in Aristotelian sense. Something to come, something to appear. In other words, the possible, the possible connections between images don't rely on similitude, on, uh, on the fact that they are somehow similar, um, but on difference, distance, underlying gestures, latent possibilities of connections, that vary from formal to semantic to, historic, to historical to anthropological or they are purely idiosyncratic. The idea that underlies is something that stems from the two reference figures of Nietzsche and Burkhardt that Warburg in a conference uh, from 1927 calls seismographs. This idea of the seismograph can be applied of course to Warburg himself. Um, to Warburg himself, and the figure of the plate or the table, and Philippe Alain Michaud, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Georges Didier Berman makes always this connection between the plate where the images are put together and the table where the images lay is, uh, corresponds to the same. Um, the table or the plate are tools for orientation. And it's curious because it's precisely that name that Warburg called to the table, to his desk, that when he was uh, at the clinic, during the period that he was um, at the, the Lake Constance being treated by Binswanger, he asked Binswanger uh, to, uh, if someone could bring his desk with all the objects that he had on top of his desk. 
And for years, he did nothing more than um, follow the flight of butterflies, that was his main occupation, and moving the pieces, the, the, the things that he had on top of the desk. And he was always saying that he was, uh, that desk was his orientation map. So he was orienting himself, just moving the things on top of the plate, which is basically the same thing that he would do afterwards with the, with the Builder Atlas. So, in a very metaphorical but very powerful way, it introduces the picture plane as the roadmap to build, as well, uh, as, well as the library. It's the haptic version of, of this. Both of them combined can be the role models for curatorial activity, but I think perhaps in the discussion we can return to, to this. Uh, I would like now to focus on the um, last way of understanding collage and montage, but now applied to sound and to the body on the work of John Cage and Mercy Cunningham, both on each one and on the work they developed in collaboration. Cage began to work on the possibility of introducing chance in musical composition in order to get rid of taste, as he said very frequently, his own taste in a very Duchampian way. I, I don't talk about Duchamp because th that role is completely to Luis Camillo that will, <laughs> that will occupy all this, all this field. The first step was using the large charts that he needed for the rhythmic sections of a piece for Cunningham and allowing the format of the charts to determine the structure of the composition. The next step came from the reading of the Book of Changes or I Ching. I would like to read you just a little bit from Calvin Tompkins. <clears throat> I forgot to take the book out. So Calvin Tompkins, uh, for years and years, uh, wrote biographical pieces for The New Yorker on lots and lots of artists. And one of the artists that he wrote about was uh, John Cage. And uh, he says in this, uh, in this article written in 1964, in, compo in composing his music of changes, Cage began by drawing up 26 large charts on which to plot various aspects of the composition. Sounds, durations, dynamics, tempi, and also silences, which were given a value equal to that of the sounds. Every single notation on each of these charts was determined by chance operations based on the ishing. To plot a single note, for example, Cage would toss three coins six times. The results, carefully noted down on paper, would direct him to a particular number in the Ishing, which in turn would correspond to a numbered position on the chart. This, however, would determine only the pitch of the note, and the whole procedure would have to be repeated over and over to find its duration, timbre, and other characteristics. So imagine the, the huge work to introduce chance in musical uh, composition as he was practicing it. Since the piece lasts 43 minutes, the total number of coins tossed that went into it was astronomical. Cage worked on this specific piece, the first big piece that he did using the Ishing, steadily for nine months. And the completed work had its premiere at Cherry Lane Theatre in the winter of 1952. The work of Mercy Cunningham that you are seeing there, after he stopped his collaboration with Martha Graham, 
developed in the path of a division of the body in parts. To each one of them, he would assign a specific set of movements, then taught to his dancers, that would interpret them in also specific ways. The result is a very complex structure of collage of movements that in the end tend to reconfigure the space of the performance because the frontality of the audience is no longer required as well as the body of the performer, the performer required to learn a set of different movements that don't follow a liquid approach to movement or the structure of the body, but a completely structural one. The space of the stage is transformed into an arena that is activated in all directions of space, but the motor for the choreographical composition is a set of directions produced by a scattered body, by a scattered body. What is more interesting is that the connection between music and choreography is decided by a time frame with the structure accorded between composer and choreographer, but the encounter between the two, music and choreography, is a blind date, locating the idea of totality of dance music experience, both for dancers and for the audience, in the realm of chance, as a collage decide, decided by purely structural aspects. In many ways, this constructive possibility that appeared in the cage Cunningham stems from collage understood as an editing process, both of music, inside the music composition, in the juxtaposition of sound and movement, and delivered in a way that transforms the space of representation in a non-perspectival construction of the performing, the performing space. Collage, as such, is always a confluence of fragments that have in themselves the hope of a possibility of a latent totality, but above all, above all, changes perspective for a different understanding of a non-hierarchical space. In the Berardo collection at uh, Centro Cultural de Belém, there is a drawing from Lisitsky dated from 1919, one of the jewels of the collection, of course, with the title, Poon A, One, The Bridge. It is a very curious drawing, mainly because its architectonical representational model is the perspective. In 1923, the very famous representation of the Poon space designed for the Große Berliner Kunstausstellung, doesn't use the perspective model anymore, but it uses exon uh, exonometry instead. There are strong reasons for Lisitsky uh, to change a perspectival representation for an exonometric one. And uh, for that, let's just listen to the description that uh, uh, Eva Forgax uh, does of the Poon uh, space. And she says, invited to exhibit it in November Gruppe section of the Große Berliner Kunstausstellung, which took place in the Lerter Bahnhof in Berlin from May to September 1923, Lisitsky was assigned a room measuring approximately 3 meters per 3 meters per 2.5 meters which he turned into a single, physically and compositionally coherent work of art. An array of abstract shapes runs along the walls. Instead of highlighting the main wall, that, this is quite important, instead of highlighting the main wall, the wall with full, full view at the entrance of the room, which, which would be, uh, or which would represent the use of a frontal perspective, or leaving the viewer in the middle of the room to experience the space all at once, Lisitsky predetermined the viewer's itinerary, encouraging him to walk in around the room counterclockwise. Lisitsky's space, in fact, 
materializes Malevich's ambition to transform the hypothetical interior of a suprematist painting into three-dimensionality. Some experiences in this sense had already been carried out within Unovis, such as the sets for the opera Victory Over the Sun in Vitebsk in 1920, or for Nina Kogan's suprematist ballet. However, Lisitsky positioning, occupying, if not theoretically, at least in its consequences, a hinged space between Malevich's suprematism and Vladimir Tatlin constructivism, is particularly exposed to the connection between the prune space and the text K und Pangeometrie that Lisitsky would publish in 1925, two years after the Berlin exhibition. This text is very complex in its criticism of Euclidean perspective and argues for the use of axonometry. This position, although it seems too technical, is important for understanding Prun's spatial question. The central idea of the text is that the planimetric representation starts from an arithmetical numeral progression, one, two, three, four, five, etc., <clears throat> while the perspective starts from a geometric progression, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. If we take the pictorial surface as corresponding to zero, the real space as the positive progression, plus infinity, and the perspective space beyond the pictorial su surface as a negative minus infinity, the central issue of suprematism is the identification as the ground, ground, not uh, what is in front, with the white plane of the pictorial surface, which he does because he paints uh, white the floor of the pound room, objects floating freely in a non-perspective depth of the representation. The center of this critical need is the staging of a new protagonist, the viewer, seen as a mobile entity in space that through his movement defines a temporality of the work non -co now considered a unity to be, so a possible unity. The path of the relations between collage and montage is this possibility of a unity to be, to be constructed of course, among the ruins of the scattered image, the scattered space, and now we can suspect the scattered viewer. Thank you uh, very much, Delphine. Lots of issues in this uh, talk, so it's open to Q&A. Someone wants already to start? Well, as I'm mediating here, we'll start. And because <coughs> When you mention uh, the Kurtzschwitter's letter to Alfred Bach and he's, well, putting on this idea of a cubist sculpture. Yes. And I wonder how can we link this idea of a cubist sculpture with this last quote from Lisitsky that uh, start to think on the positive side of space, not the negative side of space. And so how the cubist collage is delivering this relationship with, uh, let's put in this common sense word, the real space and real material. Uh, as, as politicians used to say, thank you very much for this question. Uh, now, the, the, it, it's very. Uh, your, your question is very is very is very sharp uh, because it, it, as a matter of fact, it corresponds to 
two main um, two main points. The, the, the first one is the um, the the real close relationship that Schwitters had with Lisitsky, and uh, so the, the 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 discussions about um, uh, the possibility of making an artwork that would be uh, penetrable, penetrable, uh, by the viewer. Uh, we know that it was on top of their of their uh, conversations, and of, uh, and the term real space is precisely the term that um, Lisitsky introduces in the Incook conference. Uh, in 1923, so uh, the, the the it's very curious how this idea of, of real space um, and David Summers, who is a, a theorist on space and an historian of space, he stresses very much this the, the importance of this uh, idea of, of real space, real space, which is the space that is not the space of the representation. Especially, it's not the possibility of the representation of the perspective that implies always a fixed point to the viewer. So the, the, the perspective, even if you have a, a painting with lots of, of uh, different uh, points of view, um, it involves for each one of them a definite position for, for the viewer. And the, the, exactly what, what Lisitsky wants to bring and Schwitters in a different approach, we can talk about the differences between the two, perhaps solving that uh, Lisitsky was by training an architect, so he, he, he was developing projects and uh, the, 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 the precision of the, uh, of the project was very important and the methodology of the project was very important to his to the development of his work, so it's very understandable how the, this design of the Brun space is so programmatic for him, and uh, and he even made a series of, of this is a lithograph, so uh, there is a, an edition of, of lithographs with the design of the of the the project for the Große Berliner Kunstausstellung, um, and 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 Schwitter was not. Uh, an architect, and he was very clear that he didn't want to be. So his, pro his process was a much more organic one. He was beginning he, the, with, with the, the column, uh, Zoila, and then he was gluing things around and gluing things around until he was occupying the room and then extending to other rooms in his house. And later on in Norway, he was continuing the, the same project in a, even a more complex way. And perhaps what what now uh, makes us less visible this organic quality of the development is that in the last phase of the Norwegian uh, uh, Merzbau, he decided to paint it all white. But it's, a, it, it's very late in the, in, in the history of, of the Merzbau to have it painted white. And the reconstruction uh, that you, you, you can see at the Sprengel uh, is painted white. So you have this continuation of the unity of, of, the, uh, of, of the structure, giving it a more architectonical uh, approach. Anyway, in both cases, what they are looking is for the possibility of the beholder to have a real experience of a real space and not the representation of a space that could be somehow presented in front of the viewer. And that's why Eva Forgax is so, uh, gives such importance to uh, this, this description of the, the visit of the viewer that would be counterclockwise and not be moved or driven to what was in the wall in front because what was in the wall in front would rebuild again the perspective uh, way of representing and would give the viewer a definite point of view that would be the privileged point of view to see and would cut that possibility of movement or going around that, is, that was so important to both Schwitters and, and Lisitsky. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, it was <clears throat> perhaps one of the big mistakes of, of, uh, of Alfred Barr was not buying the, yes. the, <laughs> the Merzbau to the to MoMA. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think. Uh, Hi, 
I was really captured by your story in the Vah Books Center when you were with the boxes and all this stuff. And you were there for, you were making an exhibition, right? I was making, yes, so, I was making an exhibition, so I went there to uh, make research for, for that exhibition. Yes, yes. so I, I was wondering, like, what guided after that your choices? Because, uh, I mean, what, what makes this collective, all, all this material, a montage that is not just uh, an arbitrary uh, way of putting things together? Uh, what, 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 what can be, how can we think uh, about those other ways of connecting things and putting them together, but that d do not, but that avoids just this arbitrary and um, random way of putting together. Like, what were your ideas if it were like the similarities between images or the tension between images? How, 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 how did you think about, uh, about the effect of putting them together. Uh, you, uh, you, you were asking about the other artists and works in the exhibition, or you were asking about the, the way of installation of the Bilder Atlas? The way that you thought about how, how to uh, take yeah, those... Well, the, uh, the, the reason I was so happy to find this group of plates uh, that were bound together in a specific order, was that I had one moment of a stable succession of plates in Warburg. So, uh, what I, the, the possibility, the only possibility, was grabbing those plates and putting them next to the other, as he had in the succession, in the order that, that they were bound together. So, I had, um, I, I didn't have a map, but I had a road. Mm -hmm. So I followed that road that was there. And um, uh, I think I was extremely lucky because, uh, for example, uh, Georges Dubermann uh, uh, in uh, Les Marches Survivantes, he mentions this, uh, this uh, montage of, of that, those specific plates because it corresponds to one of the rare occasions where there was this copy, uh, this working copy. Mm -hmm. So I just had to follow the order. Uh, something that I didn't want to be was creative about how to make the constellations of plates that were the central work of, of Warburg. That would be, for, for me, it would be, unless I was there working for years and could reconfigure some, uh, it was not the case, it was the work for an exhibition. Um, uh, so I was very lucky to, to find this, and I, I was not creative at all on the way of, of displaying them. So I had one room where they were, one next to the other, in the order that Abi Warburg had let them in that folder. That's it. And the folder was, was really uh, bound together. So there was not the possibility of someone having changed the order of them <laughs> So it was there with the, with the title. And, and so I had a guideline, and I just followed that guideline. Well, of course, those connections between images and uh, um, that, that those specific connections between, between images, there are some themes that, can, that, that come to the surface that are not visible in other uh, versions of the, of the Atlas Mnemosyne. But at the time, Martin Warnke, uh, who was the person leading the... Um, the, the all, all the, 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 the complete publications of Warburg's work, Martin Warnke was um, not ending his work. It was in the middle. So the versions that he published then, that were published in, in Brazil, for example, uh, and that were published in, uh, in France and in Germany, those versions were not stabilized. So uh, I was very lucky to grab to that... Uh, to that uh, to that folder that saved my my face at, uh, at the time. So, so sorry to disappoint you, but I, I didn't have a. <laughs> uh, 
I will just carry on yep. on this same topic because I think that all these relationships between um, Kurt Schwitters, the Merzbau, even this um, whitening of the Merzbau, which I think yep. is quite curious in a way because it takes out um, a sort of more messy aspect of the mass bow because well, I think that the, there is a relationship. It's not, I've, other people have already made this relationship between the mass bow, for instance, and the 1938 surrealist installation of Marcel Duchamp. Of course. Uh, and this messy aspect brings you to a space which is not harmonical, which is always, uh, you are, let's say, you're not very welcome in the space, mm -hmm. but you want to stay there, because I think that the steaming of this sort of space is different than other more harmonical. Yes. And I think that yesterday there was a discussion on uh, one of the tables mm -hmm. around Caetano Veloso's Arasa Azul and the relationship of the montage that he made in the early 70s with the Tropicale one uh, uh, in, the, in the 60s. And I think one is more harmonical where the other one is more dissonant and much more tension. And I think that one is the white mare's bow and the other one is the, the dirty one. They're more tough. But one thing that I, I think it's uh, another aspect of this dirtiness and is the haptic aspect. And I think that the haptic aspect is something that the Boaton Valise brings in a different perspective, which I, I would link with uh, the, 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 the Atlas, which is the relationship between reproduction and this table where you you can touch and change the, yeah. the, the position after a sort of narrative that you are in a way stimulated to recreate. And so every installation produces a, a different uh, uh, discourse. So this discursive aspect is important and it's important linking what is the immateriality of the reproduction and the very uh, touchy aspect of reproduction, that is how you change. So the, the idea of the flatbed, I think it's starting there. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, you're, 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 uh, there are lots of, of things in, in, inside what you, what you just said and very, very interesting. Well, the first one, um, let's begin with the, with the Merzbau painted white. <laughs> Even when the Merzbau was painted white, the, the, the idea that um, the Merzbau, through the time, it gained uh, different, um, different areas with different names, some of them uh, completely linked to, uh, to the, the idea of Grotto, uh, to Neuschwanstein, uh, to uh, under this umbrella of Cathedral of Erotic Misery, which is very closely linked with the idea of, um, of um, the bachelor in, in, uh, in Duchamp. Um, but it, it, it never lost the possibility of, of a physical and haptic interaction with the viewer. It, it is, of course, the unity of the white makes it less organic and makes it more architectonic. Uh, very gothic, but architectonic anyway. Uh, but the possibility of using the drawers, the, uh, the, the doors, um, moving things around was part of, of how Schwitters envisioned the, the possibility of a visit. And he was even asking uh, friends of his that were visiting him and to see the Mertz Bau to leave things in the drawers, things that he didn't know what they were. And he, would, uh, he would be very, very um, 
open to this kind of interaction with the, with the work. So, uh, as a matter of fact, there is this white painting, but the, the white paint uh, in the structure doesn't destroy the haptic quality. It gives a unified visual, uh, a, a visual unity, but it doesn't destroy the haptic uh, quality of the, of, of, of the work. And, of course, now w w you are making a link that today, unfortunately, we cannot uh, use anymore um, because also uh, La Bota Valise is also an haptic uh, atlas of his own work um, because there are lots of ways that you can display it and in none of the ways to display it, you can see it all. Uh, but of course now we can we cannot try the different uh, versions because when you see one you see it inside a vitrine in a museum so you cannot touch it you cannot and uh, you can understand the haptic appeal uh, but you can understand the haptic appeal in the same sense when you see a canova and you and you also understand the haptic appeal mm -hmm. you cannot touch it it's a it's a game of, of interdiction uh, uh, I think that perhaps Duchamp had it in mind in the future, that interdiction of touching it would be part of the game. And um, I, yeah, I, I like to believe that, that it would be like that. I don't know if it was because I never read uh, anything connecting to that, but I think it could be. Um, anyway, the, um, when, you, when you think of, of, the, of the Merzbau painting painted white, you can link it perhaps more than to the Kunstpace. You can link it to the Kabinett für Abstracte Kunst, where you have exactly the same possibility of moving, I didn't mention that, but of moving uh, the panels um, and the viewer through his movement in the space have a different perception of space because uh, it, it's different. Uh, the walls have this um, first wood and then metal um, lines that are painted uh, white and gray, white and, and black, and so the, the perception of, of the space changes with the movement and also the configuration. One can hide paintings, one can show paintings, and, and all this is, is totally connected with the haptic uh, uh, perspective. Anyway, you, you, you started by saying that uh, the discomfort and this idea of unbalance in, in space is common to all these works. And I totally agree. I think that um, the, 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 the really interesting thing when we, we think about space and its representation and uh, how present it is in the art uh, from the 19th century on is a progressive <laughs> approach to space that is much more connected with the idea of vertigo than with a, a space by Palladium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, the, the idea of, of, of vertigo, of imminent fall, I think it's always, it's, it's very much present and crosses uh, modernism in a very intense way and goes beyond modernism and enters the work of, uh, of Oitisica, for example, or enters the, way, the work of Ligia Clark or enters, um, the work of, um, it can go to really uh, very thinly and subtle design spaces like with Fred Sandbeck, for example. The, this idea of, of a space that is an invitation to vertigo. And, um, uh, and, and also the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century was the, the, the moment of the discovery of um, space uh, illnesses like agoraphobia or claustrophobia uh, or the malaise de vivre in the cities, which are all connected with, with this transformation of, of the living space that brings to the surface this fascination with the idea of fall and with the idea of, of vertigo. And if we, it's just watching Hitchcock and get it very clearly. Do we have time for another question? Uh, 
Huh? Yes. So, thanks very much, Delphine, and everyone. So we have a 15 minutes break for the next table.